Vice Principals, College Head, Honoured Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. My name is Ian Deary. I'm the Director of the Centre for Cognitive Ageing and Cognitive Epidemiology. And welcome to the Centre's Medical Research Council Centenary Debate. I hope you enjoy the discussions this evening. Let me bring on our debaters for the evening. Let me introduce you to them and they'll come in now. We have, here we go, Sally Magnuson, who will chair uh, tonight. We have Kyle Thornton from the Scottish Youth Parliament. Susie, Dr. Susan Schenken. Sir Tam Diel. And Dr. Tom Russ. Well, getting that order right is going to be the hardest bit of the evening, so we've done that already. Right. So before we actually call them to the debating lectern to start with, there are some organisations that I want to introduce you to and tell you a little bit about for about five minutes. First of all, we are here celebrating 100 years of the United Kingdom's Medical Research Council. Anybody actually not aware of the Medical Research Council, not heard of it? Well, you're paying for it, so you might as well uh, know something about it. It's been going for 100 years this year, started in 1913. Its research has won 29 Nobel Prizes, and it has currently a University of Edinburgh head of the MRC as well, so it knows how to choose its heads very well. And the Medical Research Council has been responsible for some discoveries in medicine that are now household names. So, for example, it was the Medical Research Council that discovered the association between vitamin D and rickets, that viruses were a cause of influenza. It started large-scale penicillin production. It discovered the causative link between smoking and cancer, discovered the structure of DNA, developed MRI scanning. Now, we look, without giving away anything about your medical background, who's had an MRI scan? Yeah, of course, I know why. You thought, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sir Tam, I wasn't actually asking for any personal details. Yeah, yeah, okay. And the Medical Research Council contributed to the first draft of the complete human genome sequence. Now, our centre, the Centre for Cognitive Ageing and Cognitive Epidemiology, yeah, I wish I'd given it a shorter name as well, but there you go. It's been going for five years now. It was under an initiative of the research councils, including the Medical Research Council, called Lifelong Health and Wellbeing. And we ask why some people's brains and some people's thinking skills age better than others. And we think that with a population that's growing older, that's really important. And we're surprised that no other centre in the United Kingdom is devoted to this question as my researchers are. And even within the centre, in the last five years of our existence, we've been going since 2008, we've had some world first discoveries led by young researchers in the centre. So for example, the genetic and environmental contributions to your cognitive ageing across the lifetime, the fact that our brain's connections, the white matter, are so important for cognitive ageing, thinking skills in old age, and what activities, physical and mental, help the brain in old age. So today's at the centenary uh, celebrations, were any of you at the Brain Maze today? Thanks for coming to that. It seems to have been a big hit. Uh, there were over 100 people came through it. And at the end of the maze, you'll know that you had an Edwardian cafe. So we reconstructed an Edwardian cafe. And some of the centre investigators were dressed in Edwardian dress. And uh, our Centre Knowledge Exchange Officer, Dr. Robin Morton, asked me if I wanted to dress up in Edwardian dress for the cafe, and I, I politely declined, because first of all, I thought that'd be quite nice, actually. That's a kind of Downton Abbey vibe. I could get into that. And uh, I suggested I might be able to recreate uh, Hugh Bonneville, but I was told by my wife I wouldn't even recreate Julian Fellows, so I decided <laughs> it wasn't a very good idea. In fact, I'm much more like Maggie Smith, the dowager uh, duchess, I'm wheeled on every so often to say something that makes people cringe and then they have to repair it afterwards. So uh, there you go. So also tonight I want to celebrate Age UK, the charity that supports the Lothian birth cohorts. 
Anybody here from the Lothian birth cohorts? Well, any other birth cohorts? Anybody from Generation Scotland? UK Biobank? Yeah, a few of us there as well. And in fact, you probably realize that owing to a bit of a, let's call it a glitch to be polite, in the letter that went out in invitations, my telephone number was actually rather prominent on the letter and wasn't meant to be. And quite a lot of you actually ended up phoning me for tickets. <laughs> and by God, you like to blether, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> now, it was a pleasure, of course. Uh, <laughs> breaking up the, the mundane uh, day that I have anyway. But I got two remarkable telephone calls. One was from a friend of Sir Tam's, uh, Professor Sir Alan Peacock. And he had a reasonable excuse that he couldn't come tonight, having written this brilliant book, Defying Decrepitude. He, it's his 91st birthday tonight, so I, we let him off. And then a chap called me and said he couldn't make it, a chap called Peter Higgs, uh, <laughs> an 84-year-old, apparently, uh, and he was away probably at the only university in the United Kingdom that hasn't given him an honorary degree already, getting an honorary uh, degree. So just to, 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 to wind up uh, before we, we hand over to the main business of the evening. So we think around 200 odd people of the Lothian birth courts of 1921 and 1936 are here tonight. Just in case you don't know and you're not one of them, the people that are here tonight from those birth cohorts are taking part in the longest follow-up studies of thinking and cognitive aging in the world. So they are world stars, the folks that are here tonight. So just for something on that. And also, some of them, we don't just do science, study their brains and their thinking skills. We also work with artists. And we have here tonight Scotland's renowned portrait painter, Fiona Carlyle, who's been painting some of the uh, people. And you, some of you will see some of those later. The main purpose of the evening is, of course, the MRC centenary debate. But we also work with writers, and the writer Anne Lingard has been writing some of the lifetimes of the Lothian birth cohort participants as well. But tonight is for you. Now, we deliberately constructed tonight's event so that you have, that is you in the audience, have got half of the time. So half of the time is for you. So I want you not just to ask questions, I know you will, I want you to respond to points that the speakers make, fairly forcibly if you would, that would be good. I want also your own opinions. You don't have to have a question. You can actually make your own points as well. We do have meetings on cognitive aging. We do have meetings thinking about dementia. We are talking about serious things. But tonight, we're having a night off. It's a serious topic, but we're also going to have some fun, I hope. So it's not just tonight about the mental and cognitive strengths of older and younger people. It's about the value of different age groups in our changing society. So let's have fun and let's be serious. But don't just think about the brain. Don't just think about thinking. Do ask questions and make points about the value of different ages to society. So tonight, the young proposer will be batting for the old and the old for the young. And I'm now going to get off stage and hand over to the chair for the evening. And please welcome her for the centre, Sally Magnuson. Thanks very much, uh, Ian. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's a huge privilege to be here, and it's just fantastic to see uh, so many of you have, have come this evening. As I don't need to tell you, the CCA, CCAC, what a name, Ian. I mean, it does really important work. That's the key thing. I became interested myself when I was researching cognitive aging for a book I'd been writing about my mother who had dementia. What I wondered was known about natural aging, the kind that she sadly wasn't fortunate enough to enjoy. And who could tell me about it? Well, I did some reading and I came across the Lothian birth cohorts and all the unique data that Scotland's been collecting since many of you year were 11 years old. I was completely bowled over, still am, when I realised what this centre has been doing as a global first for Scotland. It's astonishing. I don't think, well, I'm sure, most of us in Scotland don't have a clue. I didn't. And uh, it's a fantastic achievement. My uh, book will be out next February, by the way, and as well as gleaning, uh, 
as well as gleaning the wisdom of, uh, of Ian Deary and John Starr for it. I also interviewed one of the 1921 cohort, uh, Robbie Forsyth, who was probably the 91-year-old that Ian was talking about. So I'm really grateful uh, to them all. Now, let me briefly describe for you the format of the evening. In a moment, I'll be inviting our panellists to propose and oppose the motion. Then I'll be taking questions and comments from the floor, uh, as Ian was saying. So do make a, a mental note of anything that occurs to you as you hear the speeches. If your memory and cognitive processes are anything like mine, you might want to take an actual note. Uh, then we'll hear some short concluding speeches, and then we'll take a vote. The motion for the debate is, this House proposes that the wisdom of age trumps the speed of youth. And in a turn up for the books, as Ian was indicating, it's been proposed not by the panel's doughty 80-year-old, but by the extremely youthful and undoubtedly speedy Kyle Thornton. Kyle is a student of, uh, well, it's not politics and economics, is it, anymore? What is it? You heard him, uh, at Glasgow University. He's 18 years old and he's vice chair of the Scottish Youth Parliament. Opposing Kyle to argue, I take it, that the wisdom of age does not trump the speed of youth is the not so youthful but exceedingly wise Sir Tam Dayell, formerly a Labour MP and one of the most formidable parliamentarians of our day. Seconding Kyle as a proposer of the motion is Susan Schenken, Senior Clinical Lecturer in Geriatric Medicine at Edinburgh University and a full research member of the Centre for Cognitive Ageing and Cognitive Epidemiology. And finally, seconding Satam in opposing the motion is Dr Tom Russ, who specialises in old age psychiatry. He's also an associate member of the centre and a clinical research fellow at Alzheimer Scotland Dementia Research Centre, both of them here at Edinburgh University. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel. Now, uh, before I ask Kyle to set the ball rolling, can I just get a sense of how opinion in the audience stands before we hear the speakers. So hands up if you agree with the motion that the wisdom of age trumps the speed of youth. Hands up if you agree. Oh, quite a lot. <laughs> and if you disagree and think that all in all you'd rather have the speed of youth any day, hands up. Right. Well, I think we can see the lie of the land before we start. Let's see whether that changes after you've heard the speeches, because in the best tradition of British debate, I'll be asking you to vote on how well argued the positions are, rather than your own personal opinion. Our two lead speakers, Kyle and Tam, will have eight minutes each to start with, and Susan and Tom will have four minutes each. And I've got some big cards here to wave at them. Okay. This is going to be a big challenge for me, this debate, because I'm going to have to do things with the clock and count minutes. I can't quite see the minutes from <laughs> where I'm sitting talking about cognitive ageing. So uh, it's going to be interesting. But with one, with one minute to go, you'll see me sort of waving frantically this. And if the speaker uh, makes a considered attempt to look the other way when I'm waving, you can shout or something. And this means, right, matey, your time's up. Okay, so without more ado, let me hand over to Kyle Thornton to begin the debate by proposing the motion, this house proposes that the wisdom of age trumps the speed of youth. Kyle. Thank you very much. As a, as a young politician, having a majority before you start speaking is a dangerous thing. It's an absolute pleasure to be here proposing that the wisdom of age trumps the speed of youth. In a world where the speed of youth is almost a prophetic ideal, it's actually quite refreshing to talk about the wisdom of age. A wisdom that's gained through learning from our mistakes, through real lifelong learning, and one which is sadly undervalued in a world of speed. In contrast to the speed of youth, the wisdom of age is much more difficult to define. I've come to define it as the collection of experiences through learning, through doing, and also simply through living, with time given ability to be wise. 
So the question then is, how does the wisdom of age trump the speed of youth? Well, the speed of youth has its virtues. It does fail in some aspects. The lack of wisdom can lead to poor decisions. The lack of experience can mean not enough is considered. And when the speed of youth fails, it very often does so because of a lack of wisdom and simply not having the knowledge to make the right decision. And so the question then is, how exactly does the wisdom of age manifest itself? Well, with age comes experience, as the saying goes. The wisdom that comes from this experience just can't be replicated. Over time, you make mistakes and you try to learn from these mistakes, or so you think anyway. And by knowing how things can go wrong, the next time you do them, you can stop that mistake from happening and thus we start to see real elements of wisdom emerging. Let's take driving, for example. We'll have a 50 or 5-year-old driver in one hand, pretty experienced, an 18-year-old driver just passed their test, very inexperienced, but he's confident, and by the virtue of the speed of his youth, he feels able to handle any situation thrown at him. So they're both driving down an icy road. They come to a corner and start sliding. Our 55-year-old, having been in this situation a couple of times before, comes gently to a stop. Our 18-year-old, however, he's never been in this situation before. Well, with his speed, he takes a quick decision, but without that wisdom, decides to slam on the brakes, as his limited experience would say is the right thing to do if you want to stop, and he spins out of control. Now, this is a pretty simplistic example, and it's quite extreme, but it illustrates for me where wisdom can, in the most simple examples, triumph the speed of youth. By having already made those mistakes, our older driver has taken a wiser decision and a better decision. For our younger driver, while he felt confident that he could react, without that wisdom, he reacted badly. But wisdom also comes from learning. Studies have shown that learning doesn't just happen while someone's at school, college, university, and formal education. Most learning actually happens during your everyday life. Most people learn more once they're out of these educational institutions than they do when they're there. And we learn by reading newspapers, watching television, going out visiting friends, and a whole host of what we do every day. Therefore, logically, the more days you've experienced, the more you've learned, and thus the wiser you are. And while the speed of youth may help in formal education, real learning doesn't begin until you go out into the real world and start having to make decisions about your own life. In youth, you may have a better knowledge of facts and figures and the textbook stuff, but with age comes a wisdom derived from real life experience and real life learning that the speed of youth simply can't replicate. And in today's modern world, I would argue that real life wisdom is sorely needed. We've got governments with ever younger leaders. Think David Cameron, Barack Obama, some of the youngest people to ever hold those offices. We have financial systems and banks where you can retire as young as 30. And we have older people with wisdom who are willing to challenge the current consensus with the wisdom of age, but are slapped down by the speed of youth for being older and supposedly stuck in their ways. So where exactly has the speed of youth got us in today's world? Well, governments across the world are unpopular. People either don't like or are apathetic towards our leaders. We had a financial crisis led by the young get-rich-quick boys that five years later we've still not recovered from. And we continue to have older people pushed out of politics and general debate and the fruits of their wisdom denied to our country. Now, in the course of this speech, I've spoken about wisdom from knowledge and about wis the wisdom derived from real life experience and learning. And I've also spoken about today's world and where the exclusive rule of the speed of youth has got us. Well, perhaps today we should listen to those with the wisdom of age and we would actually reap some of the benefits. It's my pleasure to propose that the wisdom of age trumps the speed of youth and I hope you'll join me in voting for the motion tonight. Thank you very much.
I need to hold up my card. May uh, I now introduce uh, Sir Tam Dale to oppose the motion. Thank you, Tam. Don't you think that Kyle, by his well-sculpted speech, excellent content, and persuasive presentation, has torpedoed his own case? <laughs> I listened carefully, as you know, I could just sit down straight away and said that by the excellence of what he has done, he's made his case. But I will make mine, and it's in the form of a true unalloyed experience. In 1958, I was the Labour candidate in Roxburgh, Selkirk, and Peebles. Fat chance of winning. <laughs> but I used to go around every Saturday and Sunday because uh, I was a teacher at Bonus Academy and could take the weekends canvassing. And in those days, I canvassed on my bike. And it was a wet, pouring cold Saturday afternoon in the village of Carlops. <laughs> Just, well, some of you may be from near Carlops, and you know how wet that Pentlands weather can be. And I was going from door to door saying, My name's Tam Diel. I'm the Labour candidate. They were very nice to me. And then I knocked at a cottage door. And a man shuffled and opened his door. And I gave him the spiel. And he said, come in and have a cup of tea with me. Well, there was nothing so much on that Saturday afternoon as I wanted as a cup of tea. In I went. And he shuffled off to get the kettle to boil because his wife was out. And I stood politely, as one does, in the sort of living room and looked at the pictures on the wall. I was transfixed because there was a photograph, large photograph, with the well-known figures of Niels Bohr, Albert Einstein, Wolfgang Pauli, Werner Hausenberg, Max von Planck, um, <clears throat> yes, Madame Curie, Ernest Rutherford, uh, Jones, and others. The great men of physics of 1926. And standing at the end in the row was my host of obviously 30 years before, but definitely my host. And of course, I realized that this could only be the cottage, the house of C.T.R. Wilson, of the cloud chamber, one of those who ushered in the atomic age, uh, and arguably one of the great scientists of the early years of the 20th century because the cloud chamber was really crucial to the development of physics. And one of the things that he said to me, it stuck in my mind. He said, you know, in 1926, most of those there, not all, thought that they knew everything. Werner Heisenberg certainly didn't know everything. Uh, founder of the uncertainty principle. <laughs> um, but, you see, 30 years later, it was quite clear that they'd only started. And that, of course, is where youth will always trump age. For leave C.T.R. Wilson and forward half a century 
Take the example of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, the iPad, and much else. What does he say before he died? My work of the 1990s will be forgotten. It will be overtaken by youth. With those examples, I rest my case. Tom, I did depend on you to allow me to wave my card. <laughs> You're all behaving much too well. Thank you very much. Can I now invite Susan Schenken to second the motion? Thank you very much. Well, I knew it would be a very daunting task to follow Sir Tam to the podium, or beside the podium, but... Don't you think that by his eloquent remarks he's torpedoed his own argument? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly can't counter his years of experience and his astonishing anecdotes, but I can provide you with a raft of evidence that the wisdom of age trumps the speed of youth. Firstly, some people might say that wisdom is difficult to define, but there is a really strong scientific literature which does so very clearly. Researchers from the University of California with 30 worldwide experts in the science of wisdom actually performed an exhaustive and iterative process to understand and define wisdom. And sort of to preempt any discussion that there might not be a defini def definition of wisdom, I'd like to share that with you. I'm sure you'll all agree, wisdom is uniquely human. It's a personal quality, although it may be rare, it's experience driven. It can be learned, perhaps more often from failure than from success. It can be measured and it increases with age. So my first point is that wisdom can be clearly defined and in a widely agreed definition, it is, um, increases with age. Secondly, some people might say that wisdom doesn't change with age. But I put it to you that there is evidence from several research studies across the world that show that wisdom does increase with age. For just one example, a study in the University of Michigan looked at several hundred people and had them perform a task and showed that they used more complex decision making or wisdom in making sense of situations and stories relevant to their real lives. But of course, I don't want to alienate any of the young or young at heart people in the audience tonight. The wisdom of age isn't necessarily exhibited at the oldest ages. In fact, if you think of many people who are lauded for their wisdom, Solomon, Jesus, Muhammad, Gandhi, Einstein, Shakespeare, many of them reached the peak of their wisdom in their 30s, 40s and 50s. But crucially, wisdom, unlike other mental processes, unlike speed, is maintained with age. So my second point, wisdom is related to age and increases with age. The third point I wanted to make is that wisdom isn't just an abstract concept. It's something that can be measured and actually may even have a biological basis. Several scales exist for measuring wisdom. Those of you in the Lothian birth cohorts may be astonished to learn this is a questionnaire you haven't done yet. <laughs> and these scales have been very well validated. There is also some evidence for a biological basis of wisdom. Many of you have had an MRI scan done, and there are studies of functional magnetic resonance imaging, where people are performing tasks, and we look to see which parts of their brain light up or are active during this activity. And in fact, people performing tasks relating to wisdom show like parts of their brain that consistently light up. And these parts are different from the part of the brain that's related to speed. And in fact, interestingly, as people age, this changes, and it looks like you may actually start to sacrifice the speed of youth and gain the wisdom of age in a neurobiological way. And my final point, just because speed is easy to measure doesn't mean we should fall into the trap of valuing what we can measure rather than trying to measure what we value. 
Even though performance on tests of speed may correlate with intelligence tests and other outcomes, speed's only one measure. It's separate from the whole of a person. It can be a vital part of wisdom, but it could never trump wisdom. So to summarize, I've given evidence that the wisdom of age is a concept that can be defined, measured, and has a suggested biological basis. It's been valued for centuries as a core value of the founders of much of the world's cultures and religions, as well as being a key feature of many of the individuals that you and I all admire. And it clearly trumps the speed of youth. Thank you. Thanks very much. And our final speaker in this section, it's Tom Russ to second the opposing of the motion. Four minutes for you, Tom. Well, we've, we've heard a lot on both sides of the argument about whether, whether the wisdom of age or the speed of youth should be the, the, the winner at the end of today. And, and yes, there may be some evidence that, that wisdom, if defined in a particular way, accumulates to some extent in some people during their lifetime. But perhaps it's helpful to remember that to a great extent, your abilities in youth can predict a large amount of what happens in the rest of your life. We've learned about this from, from longitudinal studies when people are examined early in life and then followed up and re-examined, often decades later. Those of you in the Lothian birth cohorts will be very familiar with this concept. But these long time scales are very important because they help us to, to be sure that the poor outcomes for, for the less able aren't the result of, of an illness impairing their function, a problem that we call reverse causality. So if cognitive function of any sort is measured in childhood, it's unlikely that an illness developed late in life um, could have influenced the measurement right at the start of the, of the long study. Thus, higher abilities in childhood mean that you're likely to live longer. And the speed of youth has about the same effect as smoking on your chance of surviving. And in fact, is a better predictor of mortality than weight cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar. But to try and convince you, I'd like to give you some examples of things that you th think might be signs of being wise, but in fact are slightly more complicated than they seem at first. And I've alluded to the, to the harmful effects of smoking, which have been known for a long time. Therefore, you might think it's wise to give up smoking. And it is. It's the best thing you can do for your health if you are a smoker. However, a study in the west of Scotland showed that actually it was the people who were brighter in childhood who went on to give up smoking. Or let's forget about smoking, what about alcohol? So we know that a moderate intake of alcohol is associated with lower overall mortality, less cardiovascular disease and, and possibly slightly better cognitive function in later life. Now some research has linked drinking wine with, with better verbal abilities later on. So after this, when we cross George Square to go to the reception after the, the debate, you might think you're making a wise decision by declining the orange juice and reaching for a glass of wine. But again, things are a little more complicated. The Lothian birth cohort study has shown us that ability in youth influences both the amount and the type of alcohol that people drink in later life. Smarter children drink wine. Or similarly, you, you might think it's wise to eat a healthy diet, rich in antioxidants, and this is associated with better cognitive abilities. But again, it's the more able children who go on to eat such diets. Tea contains antioxidants, but also caffeine. And caffeine consumption is another factor that's been associated with better cognitive performance in later life. Though, in fact, some, some of the evidence suggests it's several cups of coffee a day that's the, the magic ingredient. But once again, in the Lothian birth cohort studies, we find that it's bright children who drink coffee. And this particularly applies to posh coffee rather than instant. <laughs> so this leads me on to discuss some of the, the possible reasons why our abilities early in life might have such a great effect on the rest of our lives. There are four theories. It, it might be education, leading on to, to different jobs and perhaps a healthier environment. <laughs> And because they're not terribly important, I'll skip the next three. Um, 
but you, you might argue with me that intelligence isn't actually the speed of youth. But in fact, we know that, that reaction time, so the speed with which you make a choice or react to a stimulus, is even more strongly associated with longevity than, than intelligence is. Indeed, processing speed itself might be a fundamental cause to many aspects of ageing. And so I hope I've convinced you that actually the speed of youth is fundamental in the accumulation of whatever wisdom you might manage during your lifetime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry to cut you off in your prime tone, but I just had to wave that. You understand? <laughs> Um, now, my thanks uh, to all the speakers for, uh, for their excellent constructive speeches. We'll hear their concluding rebuttal speeches a bit later on, but it is now your turn. Um, we've got, I think, three roving microphones, um, and I'd very much like to hear what you thought of that. I mean, as, as, as Ian said, your, your questions and comments can, can range um, as far from... Uh, you know, the, the narrow um, focus of the subject as, as you like, as long as it sort of tries to engage what we're, what we're hearing tonight. What I'd like you to do is to put your hand up if you've got a comment to make, and then when the microphone gets to you, if you wouldn't mind standing up, if you can, um, that would be good because the, the video camera will be able to pick you up. Um, do we have a question? Or a comment? Yes. Thank you. I'm Diana, Diana Manson. Hello, everyone. Good point. Thank um, you. Yes. Thank you, I'm the daughter of one of your great people from the birth cohort, a 92-year-old who's as bright as a spark and more mobile than I am. Right. Uh, I, I just wanted to comment on the holistic outlook of us all here. We're holistic beings. Why do we need to divide and be divisional about the resource of youth versus age? Why can't we pool it? and learn from each other, respect each other, and just get on with each other and value each other. And then we've got the greatest resource of all. We've got a pool from both spectrums. And we, we actually value each other. And that's the most important thing for, for individuals. Thanks, Thank Diana. You. What do you think of that, Kyle? Debating sort of a world I couldn't agree more with that idea. But what I would say within our debating context is that the speed of youth can only become valuable with the wisdom of age applied to it. I mean, I'm a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament. I meet young people all the time. And the one, if there was any group of people that I would say younger people always aspire to be like or take an inspiration and wisdom from, it's older people. I see young people, you know, when they receive awards, when they do well, you know, thank grandparents. It's, you know, it's older aunties, older uncles. It's just the neighbour next door who, you know, with the wisdom of their age has believed in them and has allowed the speed of their youth to be, to be fully realised. And I would argue that, you know, with, with the wisdom of age, they're able to see just how valuable the speed of youth can be to them. So really, that's where I would take it in terms of where we are in terms of the motion is that without the wisdom of age, the speed of youth just can't be realised. OK, thank you. Let's take a few more comments. Yes. Um, yes, you, thank you. And then, and then the, the gentleman, or the lady behind, thank you. Um, Ingrid Murray is my name. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about um, the relationship with age and wisdom. I think there's a fundamental um, misunderstanding about what wisdom is, I think. Wisdom isn't knowledge, it's something completely different. And one of the most, one of the wisest people I ever knew was um, my daughter when she was three years old. And she came out with the most amazing things because she had the time to think. And I think it's the time to think that makes people wise, not a basic sort of knowledge that they might have. Um, and I'm, I'm probably a bit wrong here, but I'm thinking about. Um, a story I knew about, uh, I think it was Louis McNeese, when he worked at the BBC um, and they were doing some sort of time management study. And he said, he, this is what he did with his day. And they said, well, what do you do with the rest of your day? Obviously trying to find a reason to get rid of him or reduce his hours. And he said, think. 
And I think it's the time to think that makes us wise, not the age that we're at. Um, so I think anybody can be wise so long as they spend some time thinking rather than just doing. And I think today's world, we have to do too much. Uh, too much is expected of people at work. And I see that among the doctors who are busy following protocols rather than thinking clinically, is this the right thing for this patient? Anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Your wise daughter seems to be a supporter of those opposing the motion. <laughs> You see, the trouble with the aged is it was put by the philosopher John Stuart Mill when he used the phrase, the deep slumber of a decided opinion. That is the trouble with old people. <laughs> yes. Um, hi, I'm Cece. I think um, like wisdom is really gained by experience, but not necessary with age. So. Wisdom will grow with aging in general, but like uh, comparing people's wisdom, a young person may be much wiser than an old person based on their experience. And I think like um, speed of use re really can uh, gain more wisdom if a person is quick in relating things and working hard and l gaining a lot of experience, thinking hard. Um, the, per the young person can gain a lot of wisdom but I think um, wisdom gained by age, whether they can um, gain again the speed of use is questionable. It's very hard. So I think in many cases, really, um, like speed of use can surpass wisdom gained by age. That is my idea. Thank you. Very good point. Thank As, you. Susan, do you want to pick up that? Well, I, as I said, I think the, the, the wisdom of age doesn't mean the wisdom of old age. It means the wisdom that you gain at the age that you're at. And you can gain that at any age. And I completely agree with you and the previous speaker that some of the wisest comments are made by some of the youngest people. But that still is the wisdom of age. It's wisdom gained with the, through experience of living that you can only have with time on this earth. So it's, I think we agree, which is good. <laughs> Anybody else got a comment? Yes, sir, here. Hi, I'm John Freebairn. I'm a member of the, the 1936 cohort and also the, the, what some of you also will know about the, the six-day group. Those of who were born on the, the first day uh, of the even months of 1936. Uh, my own view is that I lean firmly towards the benefit of age. Uh, and by way of proving that, I would point out like 200, at least of us here tonight, we resat our 11 plus. Uh, when I sat at 11, I got 78%. When I sat at about a year ago, I got 98%. <laughs> there can be no doubt that age improves your ability to sit your 11 plus. I'd also very briefly like to ask Kyle a question. Given the position he's taking tonight, does he really think we should give the 16 to 18 year olds a vote in the referendum? <laughs> For the purposes of this debate, I'd have to perjure myself <laughs> and say, of course, 15 year olds should be given a vote. Well, cross fingers. Oh, come on. <laughs> now tell us the truth, Tam. What? Now tell us the truth. The truth. <laughs> <laughs> I've just said Kyle torpedo himself. I torpedo myself. <laughs> okay. Kyle, yeah. you, you pick up that point then. The thing what I'd say is it's, a, it's the wisdom of age that, that means that older people, older people in Parliament are supporting younger people to vote at 16, 17, because they recognise it's a fantastic way of reinvigorating democracy and getting more young people involved in voting and lifelong citizenship. I'd say that's the wisdom of age being shown right there, <laughs> allowing the speed of youth to take off. These are the most wonderful knots we're getting tied up in here. <laughs> Sally, if you really want the truth, I suppose I owe it to you. There are several categories, and one is old fogies, 
And another is young fogies. <laughs> and there are a heck of a lot of young fogies around. <laughs> Tom... <laughs> Tom, if I can address the back of your head, um, would you rather, you know, you're a doctor, just imagine you have a medical problem, would you rather be looked after by a young doctor or an experienced consultant? Oh, that's a different <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a rather loaded way of phrasing it. I, I, I think to some extent it does depend on the, on the problem. I, I remember when I was working in... <laughs> Well, no, no, but, but I, 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 remember, I, I have to argue against myself that I do remember that when I was working in surgery that there was, there was something very impressive about an abdominal examination by a surgeon who'd clearly put his hand on a lot of stomachs and could, he just knew exactly what he was feeling. But then again, that was in my first year of working in the NHS and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm now coming up to, to almost 10 years in the NHS and, and it's, it, it's been a different experience that, that it's... It, sadly, is, is a difficult environment to work in. And a lot of things that shouldn't be are a struggle. And towards, uh, I think, towards the end of a, a career spent entirely in the NHS, it, it is possible to, to, to become jaded, to become disillusioned. And, and whilst your intention is still to provide excellent care for, for patients, to, for it to not be as easy as it was starting out. So... I think if, if a certain level of competence is, is assumed, I think, I think <laughs> there would be a lot to be said for a younger doctor. I could try, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another comment from the floor. Uh, right up at the back there, and then we'll have, we'll have you next uh, up there. Thank you. Lady there. Jim Grant. I'm also part of LBC, and... <coughs> Uh, Tom, would you then prefer a doctor who actually uh, drank wine and had said, took coffee, or would you prefer one who had beer and uh, tea? Oh, I, I, I think I'd go for the, the happy combination of wine and tea. I thought you would, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Lady there. Hello, everyone. My name is Kasia. And for me, having knowledge is not enough. Our knowledge is measured when we can share this knowledge with others. So I've got a question to all of you. How many of you became role models to young people? How many, of the, how many of you became leaders and mentors to them? And maybe Kyle can answer my question, how important it is for you to have role models, leaders, and men mentors in your life? Thank you. Sorry? To Kyle, I think. Yeah. Kyle, for Kyle, about whether role models in yeah, your life. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think for myself and for younger people, you know, I think having those role models, you know, are incredibly important because whether it's role models in terms of, you know, what you do and how you live your life and what type of career you take, you, you know, going in blindly to something often, you know, ends up going wrong, going purely with the speed of your youth, straight forward into something, you know, I've done it myself, it very often, you know, will just go wrong. I think by having older, you know, role models who, you know, I mean, I'm a young person, but you know, I don't, I don't shy away from taking the advice of, you know, of people more experienced, of people who are older. And I think what we see is, you know, is successful young people and people who, you know, very much are regarded as, yeah, they've done well, are the people you find have, you know, have heeded the advice. All right, they've, they've made it their own, but they've taken that wisdom. And it's only with that wisdom they've been able to use the speed of their youth to actually go straight forward and to be successful. Thank you. Tam, Tam, can I ask you um, a question? It's been shown, it's been recently reported, that almost all the fastest thinkers in the world are below the age of 35, yet almost all the chief executives of Fortune 500 companies are older than 50. Now, they're some of the most important decision makers in the world. Does that not mean that youth is seriously trumped there? Depends what field. Uh, in mathematics, maybe you're older than 30. Uh, in other fields, I would be less certain about being categorical. 
But in the medical field, if I can intrude, I mean, I'm extremely impressed by these very young surgeons and the remarkable things that they do and are allowed to do uh, by the senior surgeons who think that they might be, in fact, more better at doing it. Mm, thank you. Another question or point? Yes, there. Second row there, thank you. Strong feeling. Good evening. My name is Jean Kinghorn, and I was part of the Lothian Cohort 1936 group. This is a fun comment. Firstly, I was asked, thinking about Kyle and your opening comments, I hope your mother didn't put you up to all those comments, because <laughs> they were very oh, that's clever. that's below the belt. <laughs> <laughs> the point I'd like to make, so my granddaughter will say to me, oh, Granny, how are you taking so long to do things? I said, because... In my head, I have got, look at me, my age, I've got lots and lots of information up there and I have to disseminate it. I have to evaluate my comments so when I do make a decision, it's worthwhile. I don't just say the first thing that comes off the top of my head. So that was a fun comment, but it has to do with, I think, what you were saying too, Sally, the idea of uh, when you're older, lots of the thinking process is... Um, quite different, and these people that have those top jobs have got it all up there. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you very well, much. Well, you're obviously my opponent on this occasion. <laughs> <laughs> but all I conclude is that you're a good grandmother. <laughs> well done. Susan, did your mother put you up to it? <laughs> I think my mother's in the audience. <laughs> 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 yes, question at the front here. Thank you. Uh, John Grassick, I'm also a member of the 36 cohort. I'd just like to ask Tom over his long, distinguished career if he ever said to himself sometimes, I wish I'd known then what I know now. <laughs> <laughs> That's all my comment. Mm. Thank you. <clears throat> I must say. Hindsight is marvellous. <laughs> so what do you most wish now that you knew then? What do, do I most wish? Mm. What, what... <laughs> <laughs> what is the thing that you wish that you had known most when you were young? That you know now? Not to get up people's noses. <laughs> but Tom, that's what you've done best. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's another point. Uh, yes. Ooh, right in the middle. See there? Just stand up, would you? And then we can get the... See where you are. Thank you. Hello, I'm Claudia. I'm probably the youngest here. Um, How old are you, Claudia? 13. Okay. Um, yeah, everyone was talking about um, wisdom, like, so I'm saying that's not in young people. When we have wisdom, it's just in a slightly different way. Um, we have more, like, social wisdom, because, um, yeah, the social, like, structure sort of changed in my generation and probably from yours. So we have a lot, we probably do a lot better in a sort of modern social situation than a lot of others would, because um, we have the wisdom for it, because we're used to it. Well, so Kyle's that. five years older than you, and you don't agree, is that right? No, I mean, I, what I would say is that while, while younger people do have an aptitude for the modern world, it's only with the wisdom of age you can really evaluate how useful the modern world is, and you can actually with age, you know, take a real look, you can evaluate much better, you know, how things have changed, what the positives and the negatives have been. And, you know, when you're younger, you know, like myself, it's, it's much more difficult because you've only got a certain amount of, of experience, you've only got a certain amount of knowledge and, you know, things to really evaluate, you know, what you're seeing, what, you know, modern social structures are. I mean, I think it's a very good point but certainly from, you know, in a debating point of view, I would say that 
It's only with the wisdom of age you can properly evaluate how the modern world works. Oh, well, you're really putting these people on their toes. Yes, here, thank you. Stand up. Uh, Ian Clement, um, I'm not a member of any cohort. Um, <laughs> and over 21. But I wonder again, broadening it out a bit, we live in a society where youth is almost lionized and age is almost the opposite. We hear the horror tales, we are heading to an aging population. How are we going to keep all the old wrinklies, pay their pensions, and the silly buggers want to live till 85? Um, how much of this conditioning is my society? By the way, I'm a board member of what's called a city for all ages, and we also work with you know, Professor Deary, and I'm a member of the Center for Intergenerational Practice, which works, we, you know, we integrate with young and the not so young. But then I'll finish up by saying that one of the usefulnesses of old age is that you can be skeptical. And now people can say lots of things about you, but you have the knowledge to back it up and research. Verified empirical evidence is the gold standard, not at assertions, not what various publications say, not what various ministers say, it's verified empirical evidence. And it's having the confidence to carry that forward. Thank you. Tom, you answered that? I, th I, I think that's, that's, that's quite right. And, and the, the evidence gained from experience is, um, is a valuable thing. But the, the, the difficulty is that, that not everybody does learn from experience. Um, and the reality is we've heard, we've heard a lot about mistakes and the possibility that, um, that mistakes can be terribly bad, but actually in a lot of contexts, mistakes don't always have terribly serious consequences and can often have serendipitous positive outcomes. Um, so yes, learning from experience is a good thing, but I wouldn't su suggest that, it's, it, it, that age is invariably accompanied by learning from experience. Well done, you, for working for the city of all ages. Good. Mm. <laughs> Anybody got another point they want to make? <coughs> yes. I'm one of the 1936 people, uh -huh. and I'm beginning to feel, as I get older, that all the problems of the world belong to the young. They're not mine. <laughs> I can... <laughs> I can really think about things now and a terrible panic that goes on in the world I think to myself next week that'll be all finished it'll be gone and there'll be something else and I feel when I was young I was in every panic there was in the world I was part of everything I was in every epidemic that ever happened and was there bashing my wee guts out to help now it's great I'm old enough to stand back from it all and think, you know, it'll all pass in another month, all the young folk can sort it out. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder, Susan, you're not very, very old yourself. Is that something you look forward to with the advancing years? Look forward to letting young people sort things out, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think. Certainly, as a, and the NHS team has come th through a little as we've been talking, so I work as a consultant in the NHS, and I think that one of the nice things of becoming more senior in the NHS is being able to see the younger people, the trainees coming through, who are able to do the difficult jobs, the hard jobs that require that bit of speed and rapid decision making, and then, but to be able to stand back and take that bigger picture and help to direct them to make the right decisions. And actually, I think that there is something to be said for the wisdom of the time that you have learned things over time to be able to take the step backwards and just to be able to support people who've got the energy and drive and enthusiasm at the speed of youth, but sometimes not always directed in exactly the way that you would do because you've seen it before. And let's take just a final um, couple of comments before we wind this up. Yes, there and then there and then up at the back, okay, if you want to... Get ready with the microphones. Yeah. So I, my name's Jonathan Seckel. I, I work for the University of Edinburgh. 
Um, and I sadly have only the mediocrity of middle age, not the speed of youth <laughs> or, the, or, the, or the wisdom of, of, of the years. Um, I think this is probably the only time I've ever agreed with Tam Diel. <laughs> well, I hope not. <laughs> uh, it, it seems remarkable to me that people do their most outstanding creative work in youth in almost every field. There are a couple of exceptions. So the, the, all the Nobel Prizes in physics and maths and <coughs> chemistry all come from people in their 20s. Even in my field of medicine, it's done by people in their 40s. And that's the transformational, uh, innovative areas. The only area where one perhaps would want all that uh, accumulated experience is perhaps politics, where knowledge of something beyond the political cauldron is perhaps something helpful. Thank you. No problem. Uh, we are agreed. <laughs> and it's a fact that the most radical, radical, uh, imaginative Labour government, I won't talk about my political opponents, was the Attlee government of 1945-50. Average age, pensionable. And the idea that young people are more radical in politics than elderly people is a misunderstanding of the situation. But of course, uh, in your field, you would be the first to acknowledge the very remarkable work uh, that is done uh, in your Queen's Medical Center. Thank you very much, yes. Hi, my name is Michael Mooney, and I don't think any of the cohorts would have me. Uh, I started out before the speakers uh, give us their views on the side of youth in this argument, but now I don't know whether I'm more terrified by Tom's drunken, hyped up children, no matter how intelligent they are, or by Kyle's leaders who have come to the position through making a lifetime worth of mistakes. Thank you. <laughs> Very good point. And there was somebody up the back, yes. And you, you, yes, if you'd like to get that long, thank you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Macaulay, 1936 cohort, and I would put forward the idea that Nelson Mandela is a very good example of the proposal. When he was a young man, he did things that I was really afraid for when he went to, into armed revolt. After his release from prison, by which time he was an old man, he had the wisdom to realize he had to get on with his opponents and he produced amazing results for South Africa. Yeah, but you rather make Jonathan Zeki's point that in politics, which Mandela is, perhaps it's different from many other forms of human activity. Good point. Yes. Um, uh, I'm Andrew Nevin. I just like to say, I mean, I fully agree that experience is hugely important, but that has to be accepted in the reality that the world is a changing place constantly. If you look back to, say, the First World War, when you had a lot of old generals leading every army in the world, and these generals knew exactly what they were doing, leading a cavalry charge against men with bolt-action rifles. Then the First World War started. It took them three years to work out that the machine gun existed, and it changed everything. So these men's experience actually led them to take completely the wrong approach, completely the wrong strategy. Then look to the present day, look to the... Um, the reaction to the financial crisis that was brought up. We were led into the financial crisis by youth, maybe. But the reaction to it in some parts of the world has just been, what did we do with a budget deficit in the past? We just cut the deficit, everything went back to normal. But that's just not a, rea a proper reaction to a financial crisis in a lot of ways. Like, what's happened is people have, uh, in America, they've looked back beyond living memory, almost beyond living memory, back to Roosevelt's New Deal, back to the, the, the way that we dealt with the last uh, financial crisis of this size. And it's about uh, the speed of youth, if it actually looks back, uh, back to the history books, ignores uh, their own personal experience uh, with dealing with situations that maybe weren't exactly the same, can actually have a much greater impact. So although experience is hugely valuable, if we actually accept that reality is different now, but completely different than it was 10 years ago, even five years ago, that allows us to make the best possible decisions for the future. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you.
And I'm going to take the final question from, from a gentleman who had his hand up sort of over there and was ignored. Yes, yes. Um, do you see, this, see the man there? Yeah, thank you. Arnold Moran, 1936 cohort. I sadly, like your father, was a surgeon. And a good surgeon was a good surgeon because he had good judgment. And he learned his good judgment from experience. And experience was compiled from a series of bad judgments. And I think if you're going to be successful in medicine, you need to have created that experience for yourself to have good judgment. If you fail, you enter politics. <laughs> if you fail, you fail, you enter politics. Well, what a, what a great point uh, to end on. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for all these uh, questions and comments. Um, excellent um, and have given our panel members a, a lot to think about and a lot to try and squeeze into their concluding remarks now. Um, I'm going to start by inviting Susan Schenken to return to the lectern and speaking for the motion, respond in just two minutes to the points that have been made by the audience and the panel. I thought following Sir Cam was a daunting task. This is even harder. Um, we've heard an awful lot this evening, and there's been views from both sides, and there's been views from people at all, in, at all aspects across the spectrum, and it's been great to hear all of your perspectives on this. We've heard about getting up people's noses. We've heard about social wisdom. We've heard about the trials of the NHS. We've heard there's the wisdom of age, when it's not maybe the wisdom of old age. We've thought about the distinction between knowledge and wisdom. And we've heard, crucially, I think, that context is key. And I think that really what's important here when we're thinking about the question is to understand the context in which we have to uh, think about the ideas we're representing today. As I say, I'm a clinician in elderly medicine. I'm a researcher in cognitive aging, a young and speedy one. Um, and I do see every day evidence that the wisdom of age trumps the speed of youth. And I think that these questions and the thoughts both from the platform and from the floor have really just served to reinforce that. We can appreciate speed. We do, and we enjoy Andy Murray's tennis serve. We enjoy maybe a quick fire repartee on just a minute or quickly completing Sudoku or crosswords. But in the end, I think, as we heard from the audience, these will be trumped by the wisdom of Nelson Mandela's legacy, teachings of Confucius, of Buddha, or the complexity and depth of the debate we've had this evening. And really, I think that wisdom is important, complex, and one of the most valued attributes of our society. It's distinct from knowledge. Knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit. And wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. <laughs> <laughs> So I think I'd just like to reiterate that the wisdom of age definitely trumps the speed of youth. It's not necessarily the wisdom of old age, but there's no doubt in my mind, nor should there be in yours, that the wisdom of age trumps the speed of youth. Thank you. And now let me invite Tom Russ to give the second opposer concluding speech. So we, we've tried to convince you that, that the, the speed of youth, your abilities in youth, determine a lot of the rest of what happens in, in your life. Please do vote for wisdom if you'd like to. But the reality is that there isn't convincing evidence that wisdom increases with age. Not everybody does learn from experience. Um, so if you, if you do vote against us, you'll be, you'll be voting against Shakespeare. Thou shouldst not have been old till thou had been wise. But I'd really like to leave you with a, with a concrete example of the speed of youth trumping um, the wisdom of age. A, a clinical example, a, a patient uh, in his 20s who was, who'd been in an inpatient psychiatric ward for a, a number of months and didn't have anywhere to go on leaving the hospital, but his discharge date was approaching. So he, he wrote to the matron of the local 
Young Women's Christian Association hostel, saying, could he come and stay there? He wanted to meet some girls. And the, the matron wrote to the, uh, the psychiatrist in charge of his care and, and um, complained that, that, that um, she'd been hassled in this way. And so the, the psychiatrist who was coming to the end of his career took the patient to one side and said, you know, you really, you really can't do things like this. And what, what were you thinking? This was, this was a woman's hostel. And quick as a flash, the patient came back, but if I lived there, it would be a mixed hostel. <laughs> And the wisdom of age was at a loss to, uh, <laughs> to find a response to that. So I, I beg to oppose the motion. <laughs> and now it's time to hear the concluding arguments of our principal proposer and opposer. Kyle Thornton, you first, please. You have three minutes. While I may have the speed of youth, I, I don't have the wisdom of age to give you an I, interesting anecdote along with what I'm saying. I think what I'll pick out really is, in terms of my rebuttal, is firstly in research. And it's an interesting one because, yes, the breakthrough, the imagination is made with the speed of youth, but it's practical applications, it's actual help for what we need things to do in the world can only come with time, it's with real research, it takes years to develop a practical use for a brilliant idea and it's only with the wisdom of age that you can begin to realise that practical use, you can come up with as many ideas as you want but you need the experience to actually know how to use those ideas and I mean Peter Higgs was, was mentioned before and you know he was well noted when he discovered the Higgs boson but it's only recently that, you know, that it's been proven. It's taken quite a lot of time for his initial breakthrough to be followed up on. It's taken a lot of time, a lot of experience and effort for that to happen. And, you know, in terms of the, the current political scene, in terms of, you know, it's, it's older people who, you know, with the wisdom of their age who can't realise, you know, the mistakes of the past. I would point out that most, most people in charge, most people taking these decisions are younger and actually, if we had some more older people there tell them how they did it in the past, how it worked and how it didn't work, we might be in a better place than we are now. And I think finally, there was a really you know, fair point made that you, know, you can have wisdom at any age, and I very much accept that you can have wisdom at any age, but you can't have the skills to utilize that wisdom at any age. It takes time to develop the ability to actually take your wisdom and make something of it. You can't just, in the, you know, in the flash of a moment, become wise and be able to use your wisdom. It takes a lot of time. And I think just to, just to sort of conclude on this in terms of rebuting uh, Tam's opening line uh, and his, his opposing motion, that my speech could only have come about with the wise words of those older than me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Finally, Tam, opposing the motion that the wisdom of age trumps the speed of youth. I ought to say to Arnold, the surgeon, that I wasn't a failed medic. <laughs> <laughs> but you had a point. I would refute Kyle on the example that he's just used. And Carl, it was the example of Peter Higgs. I think it was 52 years ago when I was invited to one of the science societies of the University of Edinburgh that I first met Peter Higgs. His work was done in youth and it so happened that, Ian, as you know, the Royal Society of Edinburgh had Peter Higgs's portrait uh, done by Victoria Crowe. And at the unveiling of the portrait, um, it became very clear, because he said to all of us, that great things had happened at CERN. But he found great difficulty 
in understanding it because of course he had been trumped by all those imaginative international, multinational <coughs> researchers at CERN. So Kyle, on your own grounds, <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, concludes our speeches. Please join me again in thanking all four panelists for their wonderful contributions. <laughs> now, Ian was, was um, rather optimistically, I thought, thinking that I was going to sum up the debate at this point. I mean, frankly, how can you sum that up? Um, a lot about fruit salads and uh, smart children drinking wine. And uh, the headline of the evening for me was Tam Dayal wishing he'd known when he was young that it wasn't a good idea to get up people's noses. Um, <laughs> frankly, you know the arguments. You've heard them all. There's been all sorts of interesting nuances and subtleties brought in by, by your uh, contributions, which I think have immeasurably added to the, the, the richness of... Um, the debate this evening. So um, I think we're just going to go straight to the vote. Ian's going to come out and help me take it. Just before we do, can I ask you for a show of hands on the question I asked at the, asked at the beginning, um, which is just to know this first. Hands up anyone whose vote now has changed, don't need to tell us which way it's changed yet, but has changed as a result of what you've heard and the quality of the arguments. Hands up if your, your, your vote has changed. That's a wee smattering, a wee smattering. Thank you very much. Ian, come and help me with the, the vote. Um, all those in favor of the motion that the wisdom of age trumps the speed of youth, please raise your hand. You are smashing the defeatists. <laughs> <laughs> and all those against. Ooh. Oh, it's... Ian says it's carried. <laughs> <laughs> I can now declare that the motion is carried. Congratulations to Kyle and Susan. Over to you. Thank you, Sally. Uh, it was carried, actually. There's a bit of a, a majority. I've been asked to do a few uh, rounding up comments now, and they will be a bit miscellaneous and a bit organised. First of all, the, the miscellaneous ones, I think uh, this is going to be a metaphor that really isn't going to work, but Peter Higgs's presence here has been a bit like his particle tonight, massive but invisible. Uh, <laughs> that's actually quite funny. You know, uh, it's, it's the, and the other one is, is uh, the wisdom of age, although he was only probably young middle age at the time, Professor. Arnold Moran, who announced himself tonight, was a, was a very talented uh, and distinguished ENT surgeon. And he actually taught me when I was at medical school at Edinburgh. And he was wise enough to say, Ian, you would be safer as a psychiatrist. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, those of you who are not members of the Lothian birth cohort are going to feel a bit left out tonight. I, ca I can see that. Uh, the, the, the audience was certainly replete uh, with people. The other thing I'm going to give away, you're never supposed to tell people these things, but I'm very indiscreet, uh, was that I did say to quite a number of people tonight, look, if it gets a bit quiet, would you ask a question? <laughs> and not a single person that we spiked had to, because again, you, 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 can't, you can't keep the folks in the LBC quiet, and they really got things going, so thank you very much for that. With regard to, again, I was asked to say something about the debate I think it's tricky, actually. We heard a lot about scientists, and those of us in the business and who are, are able to say that we're kind of uh, jobbing along at it and can look up at the real stars, we see two types of stars. We do see the young, brilliant ones, but we also see the folks that are older and wiser and can put together the amazing teams that will get things done as well. So it's not just a matter of the, the individual discoveries as well. And what the Lothian birth cohort makes us think about, because they do have data from childhood and right through to older ages, we can actually say, look, it's not just one or the other, it's more about what we call the, the trajectory or the path through life. And it's that that I think is both poignant, 
and informative when you think about the wisdom of age and the speed of youth. If we think on the one hand of the people who did amazingly and died early, like Mozart and like Galwa, the mathematician, and like T.E. Lawrence, a favorite of mine as well, the adventurer, and on the other hand, so the, the folks who weren't cut off and went on to late life and who were incredible, like David Hockney, like Matisse, who kept reinventing himself, and like one of my favorites, I know it would be a minority taste, but Diana Athill, who just got more amazing as she got older as well, and uh, probably my favorite of all, Thomas Hardy. I mean, who wouldn't have prayed for him to get into 70s and 80s and give up writing the novels, which are brilliant, and for those amazing winter poems that he produced as well. So again, it's a mixture there, shining in youth, but you can also shine in old age as well. So what I'm going to do next is thank the panel. And I'm sensible enough, I've got some of my bosses here tonight, and I do watch my principal, Professor Sir Timothy O'Shea. What he always does is when we have honoured speakers, etc., he offers them a little University of Edinburgh gift. And I've often seen the principal with his uh, University of Edinburgh bags. So you're about to see me uh, aping that very good uh, uh, example. And thank Sally, Kyle, Susan, Sir Tam, and Tom for their wonderful work tonight. Thank you. You're very kind. I saw you thinking, oh, I better keep clapping until he gets to the end. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a real problem there, actually, because I'd asked uh, the, the centre staff uh, earlier, could you please clip on who those things were for? But they said, you don't need that, Ian. You just need, there's three men and two women, and you only need the men's ones to be sellotaped. But by the time I got to the end, I'd forgotten, because I only had one left of each. <laughs> uh, I think I got it right. Uh, okay, right, thanks, thanks. Wonderful work tonight. Okay. Thanks, obviously, to the Medical Research Council, uh, without which we wouldn't have our centre, uh, first thing. Thanks to Age UK and the special guests we have tonight. Hello, Joanna. Uh, I didn't spot you there. Hello. Thanks to the University of Edinburgh for the wonderful support and our vice principals who are here tonight. My bosses, by the way, so it's good that you all turned out. Uh, <laughs> We had loads of helpers, and I just can't name them all, but lots of the people, the young scientists and PhD students and the staff who work in the centre, and many beyond that in psychology and beyond have helped tonight and been absolutely amazing. Dr Robin Morton and Dr Beverly Roberts took a little germ of an idea a long time ago when we thought we might do something to celebrate the MRC uh, centenary, the 100 years of the Medical Research Council, and do the brain maze in the day and the debate in the evening. And we all thought, and well, that would be good fun. And it's been really amazing. So special thanks to, to Beverly and to Robin. Thanks to the centre core staff, the Lothian birth cohort staff, and the cohort who've supported us so well, the PhD students and the others. So thanks to all the folks who've made it a really good evening and day as well. Thank you. Robin, have I forgotten to thank anybody? Okay, I don't know either, but uh, yeah, it, consider it just my fault if we haven't. We're actually going to finish dead on time, which is most unusual. Now, next is, I've just got to say this diplomatically. If you've got a ticket for the reception across the way in 7 George Square, you'll know you have. And if you don't, we've got some big bouncers that won't let you in, okay? <laughs> so... so we're looking forward to seeing you across at the reception if you're coming across to that. And I've been told that, first of all, because it's a busy night and folks have got to uh, get across, we're going to let the stage party and the folks at the front uh, clear off first. And then, but most of all, I'm going to thank you for that wonderful half hour we had when really we didn't know what was going to come next. And each time we're more delighted than the last. Thank you so much and good night. Thank you. <laughs> This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.